Right. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another CAS webinar. Tonight we have space news from Roy Bryce. Then our main speaker for this evening is Dr. Richard Miles from the BAA, whose presentation is entitled Fire and Ice, Introducing the Two Most Volcanically Active Bodies in the Solar System. Our next webinar is on the 26th of April, when our speaker will be Bob Bauer, whose presentation is entitled A History of the Telescope. Now it's over to Roy for Space News. Ooh, as usual, it's taking a second or two to share my screen. So hopefully you can now see the... Yes. Oops. Ooh. That went too quick. <laughs> okay. Right. So things appear to be working. Always a good start. So for those of you that were here in my last Space News, I spent some time talking about Oumuamua. Research and another interstellar visitor is proving to be interesting as well. <coughs> They, uh, could you actually mute yourself, folks, please, Janice and Wendy? Oh, that was Dave Coffin. Sorry, I forgot. Sorry. Thank you. By comparing our local comet, Hale Bop, to the interstellar visitor Twentwan Borisov, a team of astronomers have concluded that the interloper is perhaps one of the cleanest comets we've ever seen. Twentwan Borisov could represent the first truly pristine comet ever observed said Stefano Bagnolo of the Arma Observatory and Planetarium in Northern Ireland. He led the new study published recently in Nature Communications. Many comets pass at least once through the inner solar system in their lifetimes. When they do, they encounter the solar wind and any other random pieces of microscopic junk floating around. This contaminates them to such an extent that astronomers can determine how many passages a comet has made since it formed. Comet Hale Bop, which wowed stargazers in the late 1990s, was amazingly pure. Astronomers estimated that prior to its entry in the late 20th century, it had only passed close to the sun once before. Using the FORS-2 instrument and the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope in Chile, a team of astronomers carefully studied the interstellar comet 21 Borisov. That visitor was discovered by amateur astronomer Gennady Borisov, in August 2019. And it was the second known interstellar, interstellar interloper to our solar system after a moon. The research team found that Borisov and Hale Bop were remarkably similar. This fact suggests that the alien environment in which 21 Borisov originated is not so different in composition from the environment in the early solar system, and that such environments would be common throughout the galaxy. And now my favourite topic, as you probably know, Mars. All across the Martian surface, there are preserved features that tell the story of what Mars once looked like. These include channels that were carved by flowing water, delta fans where water deposited sediments over time, and lake beds where clay and hydrated minerals were found. In addition to telling us more about Mars' past, the study of these features can tell us about how Mars made the transition to what it is today. According to new research led by Brown University PhD student Ben Boatwright, an unnamed Martian crater in Mars' southern highlands showed features that indicate the presence of water. There's no indication of how it got there. Along with his advisor, Professor Jim Head, they concluded that the crater's features were likely the result of runoff from a Martian glacier that once occupied the area. The crater they examined is located in Mars's southern highlands, measures 54 kilometers in diameter, and dates to the Noachian era on Mars about 4.1 to 3.7 billion years ago. Based on images obtained by NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, they mapped out the crater's floor and found features that are unmistakably indications that stream beds and ponds once existed there. However, this crater also showed no evidence of inlet channels where water could have flown into the crater and no evidence of groundwater activity 
where it could have percolated up from below. As Boatwright said, this is a previously unrecognized type of hydrological system on Mars. In lake systems characterized so far, we see evidence of drainage coming from either outside the crater, breaching the crater wall, and in some cases flowing out the other side. But that's not what's happening here. Everything's happening inside the crater, and that's very different from what's been characterized before. The features are known as inverted fluvial channels, which are formed when water flows across rocky surfaces, leaving coarse grain sediment inside the channel it carves. When these sediments interact with water, they can form minerals that are harder than the surrounding rock. After eons of erosion has worn these rocks down, the mineralized channels would remain as raised and branching ridges. To determine how the water could have arrived there, Boatwright and Head began by ruling out groundwater systems, since the crater lacked the telltale sapping channels that form in their presence. These features generally appear as short, stubby channels that have no tributaries, which are starkly different from the dense branching networks of invertebrate channels they observed. They also noted the presence of a distinct set of ridges that face upward towards the crater wall, which bear a striking resemblance to ridges on Earth that formed at the edges of glaciers. With these observations combined, they concluded that the crater's inverted channels were created by a glacier-fed system that slowly deposited sediment and minerals over time. In addition to being the first of its kind to be discovered, this new hydrological system could also provide vital clues about the early climate of Mars. Scientists have known for some time that Mars was once warm enough to support liquid water on its surface. However, it's still unclear whether the climate is mild enough for this water to flow continuously, or if it was mostly glacial with intermittent periods of melting. In the past, scientists have concluded climate simulations, sorry, conducted climate simulations that suggest that early Mars experienced temperatures that rarely peaked above freezing. However, there has been little geological evidence to support these models. <coughs> As Boatwright explained, this new evidence of ancient features that are associated with glacial runoff could change that. He said, the cold and icy scenario has been largely theoretical, something that arises from climate models. But the evidence for glaciation we see here helps to bridge the gap between theory and observation. We have these models telling us that early Mars would have been cold and icy. And now we have some really compelling geological evidence to go with that. Not only that, but this crater provides the criteria we need to start looking for even more evidence to test this hypothesis, which is really exciting. What's even more exciting <clears throat> is that this crater isn't a one of a kind. During the 52nd Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, Boatwright presented subsequent research that's revealed more than 40 other craters that appear to have similar features. The previous research was published in a paper that appeared in the March 12th issue of the Planetary Science Journal. As you know, I don't normally show videos, but I'm gonna try a short one just to see what happens. I thought this was kind of interesting, so hopefully it's looking all right at your end and running fairly smoothly. Countless shards of frozen water ice form Saturn's rings, which range in size from microscopic icy dust to bus-sized icebergs. Each piece has its own orbit. Close to Saturn, the orbit fast. Far away, the orbit slow. Major ring segments are labelled A to F in the order of their discovery. So again, it's really showing you more to sort of back up what you would expect, that the nearer the planet th the rings are, the faster they go, but the actual observations have now been used to prove it. Most of that, as you can see, it's nearly all from Cassini. NASA's InSight lander felt the distant rumble of two major Mars quakes in March, originating from a region near the Martian equator known as the Cerberus Fosse. Registering magnitudes of 3.1 and 3.3 on March the 7th and March the 18th, respectively, the quakes cement the Cerberus Fossil's reputation as one of the most geologically active places on the Red Planet today. 
a pair of similarly strong Mars quakes rocked the same region back in 2019. The Cerberus Fosse region is scarred by a series of massive, nearly parallel fissures, created when the planet's crust was pulled open by a dramatic volcanic event. Volcanism is the primary driver of quakes on Mars. The red planet lacks the tectonic plates that cause most of the quakes we feel here on Earth. On Mars, the Cerberus Fosse region is one of the major epicenters of such activity, and it's a fascinating area to study because of its geological instability both in the past and in the present day. Our ability to detect Mars quakes is very new. Geologists have suspected their existence for decades, but it wasn't until InSight fired up its seismic experiment for interior structure in early 2019 that scientists were able to incontrovertibly catch a recording of one. The Viking II lander observed an event back in 1976 that may have been a small quake, but at that time, it was impossible to rule out wind or weather as the cause. InSight, on the other hand, has now found hard evidence of over 500 seismic events in just the last two years. Most Mars quakes detected by SEIS have been small, but those originating from the Cerberus Fosse are amongst the clearest and strongest yet. Incredibly, geologists were able to predict that InSight might hear quakes from the Cerberus Fosse region six years before the spacecraft even landed. Back in 2012, a research team used imagery taken by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter high-rise camera to examine the area and discovered evidence of recent landslides, as well as boulders that rolled down the steep slopes of some of the chasms. These rock slides seem consistent with the after effects of earthquakes here at home, suggesting that a Mars quake might recently have occurred. Insight's new detections validate that theory. As John pointed out after the last space news, it's proven to be very difficult to get good readings from InSight's size monitor due to the strong wind noise interference during the Martian winter. The lander used its scoop on its robotic arm to begin trickling soil over the cable connecting its seismometer to the spacecraft on March the 14th, 2021 the 816th Martian day of its mission. Scientists hope that this will make it easier to detect Mars quakes by helping to insulate the cable from the wind and from the extreme temperature shifts that cause the cable to expand and contract. X-rays offer a unique insight into the astronomical world. Invisible to the naked eye, most commonly they are thought of as a semi-dangerous source of medical scans. However, X-ray observatories like Chandra are capable of seeing astronomical features that no other telescope can. Recently, scientists found some of those X-rays coming from a relatively unexpected source, Uranus. While the data might have been found only recently, it was actually collected almost 20 years ago, in 2002, and then again in 2017. Despite the age of the data, scientists have a decent theory on what might be causing most of the observed X-rays. The Sun's the most likely culprit. Both Jupiter and Saturn scatter X-ray light from the Sun, so there's a good chance that Uranus does the same. Some of these X-rays would bounce back to Chandra. However, that reflection doesn't appear to be the only source for the observations. A recently released paper in the Journal of Geophysical Research offers up some suggestions for other sources of these X-rays. Both have unique implications for our understanding of Uranus. One potential source is an underappreciated feature of the Uranian system, its rings. Uranus is in fact surrounded by a ring system. Although not as spectacular as Saturn's, Uranus's rings have the unique property of sharing its host planet's axial tilt, making it look like they're lying on their side when observed from Earth. The rings themselves can emit X-rays if they're struck by the right charged particles, such as protons and electrons which are present in the general area of the ring system. This process is well understood and has been observed in other ring surrounded planets. However, the other explanation is a little more whimsical. Uranus's auras or auroras. Auroras on Earth produce spectacular light shows known the world over. They also emit X-rays when the high energy particles that cause them interact with the Earth's atmosphere. That effect could be the cause of some of the X-rays seen by Chandra. Hubble spotted what appeared to be an aurora on Uranus back in 2017. So the planet's known to have them, 
but so far they haven't been studied much. On Uranus, the auroras might be much different from those on the other solar system planets. Uranus has a unique spin axis and magnetic field alignment that make it stand out from its planetary brethren. In fact, the magnetic field of Uranus doesn't exactly follow the actual tilt of the planet itself. That slight offset could cause much more complex aurora than would be present on more aligned planets, such as Earth or Jupiter. So far, it's not clear which, if either, of these two other sources of X-rays is actually the cause. For now, Chandra will continue its observations, and hopefully this paper will spark enough interest to turn its eye towards Uranus a little more frequently. And now back to Mars. Perseverance is having a proud parent moment in this image, looking like it's waiting with a child at the bus stop on the first day of school. The Mars 2020 rover took the selfie with the Ingenuity helicopter, which is preparing to take the first control flight ever on another world. On April the 3rd, Ingenuity was removed from its carbon fibre compartment on the underside of Perseverance. While Persony has now moved further away from the helicopter, the proud parent will stay nearby for Ingenuity's first flight, as well as the 30-day testing window to provide support and to relay commands from Earth. There's an overlook point about 200 feet away where Percy will watch, i.e. take pictures, of the Mars helicopter's first flight. Based on data from the Ingenuity Mars helicopter that arrived late Friday night, NASA has chosen to reschedule the first experimental flight to no earlier than April the 14th, which I think is Wednesday. During a high-speed spin test of the rotors on Friday, the command sequence controlling the test ended early due to a watchdog timer expiration. This occurred as it was trying to transition the flight computer from pre-flight to flight mode. The helicopter is safe and healthy and communicated its full telemetry set back to Earth. The watchdog timer oversees the command sequence and alerts the system to any potential issues. It helps the system stay safe by not proceeding if a problem is observed and it therefore works exactly as it was meant to. The helicopter team is reviewing the telemetry to diagnose and understand the issue. Following that, they'll reschedule the full speed test. Several years ago, there was a whole lot of excitement that Earth might get hit by the asteroid Apophis if its orbit turned out to be just so. Well, on March 8th and 10th, its orbit and Earth's came together, but at a healthy distance. And new measurements determined that it won't hit us in 2029, 2036, or even 2068. Beyond that, there's still a risk. This 350 meter diameter asteroid is just big enough to do a lot of damage if it collides. And its Earth crossing orbit crosses a bit too close to Earth for comfort. Earth crossing just means the orbits intersect. It doesn't mean the objects intersect. In the best case scenario, an asteroid crosses Earth's orbit when the Earth is far away, like the other side of the sun far away. Apophis, however, likes to get close and will endanger satellites as it flies beneath all the geostationary weather and comm satellites in 2029. With this new data, Apophis has been removed from the potentially hazardous to humans list. And it'll be interesting to see if we're able to get any cool image of it as it flies underneath the weather satellites in 2029. We aren't always that lucky with asteroids. We suspect our own moon was formed when a Mars-sized object hit the proto-Earth and generated a splash of lighter weight material that formed the moon and the heavier bits of both objects stayed together to make up our Earth. In a new paper in Science, Scientists use seismographic maps of the Earth's innards, maps like InSight's tried to make on Mars, to identify two continent-sized layers of rock buried deep inside the Earth's mantle. These structures are unusual, and according to the article summary, they may simply have crystallised out of the depths of Earth's primordial magma ocean, or they might be dense puddles of primitive mantle rock that survived the trauma of the moon-forming impact. But based on new isotopic evidence and modelling, lead author Qian Yuan believes the structures are the guts of the ancient impactor itself. We aren't in any position to go digging, but it's interesting to think that there might be some shrapnel still intact inside our world. Since that fateful impact, rocks have continued to fall out of the sky in a variety of sizes, and sometimes they explode in the atmosphere instead of hitting. 
This happened over Tunguska in Siberia in 1908, over Chelyabinsk in Russia in 2013, and has probably happened many other times over places that had fewer humans to notice. One of these times seems to have been about 430,000 years ago over modern day Antarctica. Researchers exploring the summit of a mountain in East Antarctica found myriad small weird nodules that appear to have come from an object bigger than your typical airburst, but that didn't crater the planet. This research is published in Science Advances with lead author Matthias von Giddeken and shows that medium sized asteroids can be dangerous in a new way. They can literally explode into a massive cloud of tiny rocks in what's been called a touchdown event. According to Van Ginneken, while touchdown events may not threaten the human activity of occurring over Antarctica, if it was to take place above a densely populated area, it would result in millions of casualties and severe damage over distances of up to hundreds of kilometres. In fact, if you think about it, it's almost as if somebody had fired the world's biggest shotgun at Antarctica. It's a reminder, space will try and kill us, and we're still trying to discover all its different weapons. So, thanks to the Universe Today people for the newsletter that gives me all this date, up-to-date info, and compile this for you. And that's the Space News tonight, so back to Alice Amanda. Right, thank you, Roy. That was really interesting. Aye, because I hadn't heard about that one, that last one in Antarctica. Uh, that was no, really interesting. Aye. I just, I like the image of, the, you know, hundreds of these shotgun pellets coming down. Aye, aye, it looked an amazing image. Yeah. All right. Um, Richard has been a lifelong amateur astronomer and observer of the heavens since the age of six or seven. Now retired from his day job as a research scientist working in the petrochemicals industry, a member of the British Astronomical Association since 1966, he served as its president in 2005 to 2007 and took on the directorship of the BAA's Asteroids and Remote Planets section in 2008. He has built and operated three observatories over the years, the latest being Golden Hill Observatory in Dorset. His main interests are comets and asteroids, and during the past 10 years or so, he has been particularly fascinated by the behaviour of one particular comet with the tongue-twisting name of 29P Shu Vassman eh, Vakman, the behaviour of which <laughs> is yet to be fully understood. He has had four papers published in the professional literature in recent years and has given many talks at international meetings. That was up until two years ago. Today he intends to open your eyes to the mystery of Comet 29P and volcanicity in our solar system. Let's give Richard our usual warm Kaz welcome. Okay, I'll uh, share my screen if I can. See, I've got various bits to show, so let's see if it goes, let's see if we can find a PowerPoint. Okay. That's got it, Richard. Is that looking good? That's it, perfect, yep. You can hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, let me um, just see if, there we go. That's it. Right, well, welcome everyone. Thanks for turning up. Uh, it's not so difficult to get to the meetings these days. Um, yeah, rather than just talk about the comet, I thought, well, why not um, expand it to a subject of volcanicity? Because it's really in the news these days. A volcano has erupted in on St. Vincent in the Caribbean. And of course, there's the Icelandic volcano that's hit the news as well. So to understand um, something about Comet 29P, I think it's, it's good to compare and contrast it 
with things that we're more familiar with, volcanoes. But uh, did you know that um, volcanoes come in two flavors, hot and cold, fire and ice? And um, there's two that uh, stand out. Um, I guess you uh, have already imagined which is the, uh, the hot one. That's this, this uh, body here, which uh, if I had an audience in front of me, I could ask what it is, but it's the satellite of Jupiter called Io. Um, when I say the most volcanically active bodies, I'm excluding the Earth from this, but I'm going to mention the Earth and we'll, we'll go over live to Iceland and see how it's getting on in a few minutes. But um, the Earth is actually the most volcanically active, and that's partly or mainly because we have the moon so close orbiting and the tides generate friction inside the Earth. So as well as causing the oceans to rise up and fall, uh, there's an awful lot of friction which keeps the molten uh, interior uh, molten and uh, active. And indeed, uh, that's the basis of volcanicity. But, so the Comet 29P, that, um, I'll say something a little bit about that um, in that you don't expect comets to be volcanic, do you? Uh, but what we see with 29P is we see it having many outbursts. And normally with a comet, um, comets approach the sun on a parabolic orbit and, and reach perihelion where they're heated by the sun and they're hottest near perihelion. And that's when the thermal stresses cause things like outbursts. But an ordinary comet will only outburst once or twice or so as it goes near and through perihelion. But 29P actually does it over and over again. And the mysterious thing about the comet is actually it's not really a comet. The mysterious thing is not in a cometary orbit. It's actually in a virtually circular orbit trapped beneath the planets of uh, Jupiter and Saturn, the giant planets. Okay, so let's just quickly look at Io. Io is one of the Galilean satellites and there are four major satellites. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there. So uh, Io is hot and what I'm going to say is 29P is cold, but volcanic. So Io sits closest to Jupiter. And Jupiter is over 300 times more massive than the Earth is. Uh, and Io orbits every 41 hours, sits in very close. And because of that, the tides on Io are very, very much more uh, uh, energetic. It causes the surface, the actual surface of the satellite to rise and fall by about 100 meters as it goes as it uh, goes around. And actually the other Galilean satellites also help to pull on Io and cause it. And it's that friction, just like I mentioned about the Earth, it's that friction inside Io that generates heat, heat that's sufficient enough to melt the interior. Now, the, the opposite is the cold environment of Comet 29P because it's out beyond Jupiter. And it's not actually close to anything else. It's in its own orbit, minding its own business. But how did it get there? Maybe that can tell us why it stands apart from most comets. Well, it's almost certain that it started life in the trans-Neptunian region of the solar system. So there's many, well, tens of thousands of objects probably of the same size as 29P out there at the moment. But occasionally the gravity of Neptune will tug on, on one or other of the objects and start to pull it in towards the inner solar system. And, and what happens is it's a, it's a gravitational dance where the gravity of Neptune pulls it a certain way and then Uranus takes over. And it's sort of handed down from Neptune to Uranus to Saturn. And then when it gets too close to Jupiter, it's, it can get trapped. Some, quite often, things get thrown out of the solar system completely as they get too close to Jupiter, or they get thrown into the inner solar system and they become what's called a Jupiter family comet. 
but those are all very small, just a few kilometers across. But 29P is actually big because it's, it's a big, what we call a center object. And what's happened, it's, it's maybe only taken so many tens of thousands of years, but it's gone and got itself trapped by the gravity of those two giant planets. And it's not going anywhere fast at the moment. Right. So looking more closely, if, what, what it does, it has outbursts. And the comet is in the vacuum of space. So when it has an outburst, the material is thrown, thrown out. Most of it heads off into, into interplanetary space. And this is a picture, the next picture is taken with a two meter telescope. And it shows in more detail the coma, the outburst coma. And this, this particular image taken in 2009 shows actually the result of two outbursts. Can you see that in the inner part, there's a, a brighter region, and then there's a, again, a much larger region. Well, that's because there were two outbursts about 12 days apart. And um, the first one is expanded out into a much larger halo, but the, the later one is, you can see a bit more structure on it. And we call it, it looks as a particularly characteristic shape, which we call a Pac-Man shape uh, from the Pac-Man computer games of yesteryear. And that shape is partly the result of the fact that you've had a volcanic eruption on, on the nucleus of the comet. And as the gas and dust is ejected, um, the body of the nucleus of the comet is so big that it stops the material heading out in one direction. And so you, what you see is like a, a hemisphere almost, or a big hemisphere of dust and gas that heads off away from the nucleus in one direction. And that's one of the explanations of why it looks like that. Okay, so that's briefly those the two objects. And what we're going to think about, or I'd like you to think about is, you know, the difference between fire and ice, between hot and cold, between volcanoes and cryovolcanoes. Now, I'm sure you're all well aware of volcanoes. Unfortunately, we, we don't have any active ones here. The ones that are still left in Scotland and have, have lost their activity many hundreds of millions of years ago. Um, and we're left with the Isle of Skye and such. But, um, there are such things as cryovolcanoes, and it's actually the same process where you have a, a molten fluid below a crust, uh, where the fluid is molten and has a certain amount of energy. And if, if for whatever reason the crust breaks open, uh, the material beneath it can start to come out. Now, in the case of volcanoes, we, we're always well aware of the um, erupted ones, the explosive eruptions, and everybody knows of uh, Mount, uh, Mount Vesuvius and and how eruption wiped wiped out um, parts of, uh, of the Roman uh, uh, people as, uh, by those eruptions. But also Mount Saint Helens was a particularly explosive one, where the whole side of the mountain about a kilometer across was just blown away completely in one event. And what's not quite understood is that many volcanoes aren't like that. Uh, instead of being explosive, what they are is they're effusive. And that's because they don't build up the pressure below the crust, which explosive eruptions have. Um, so think about Iceland, and at the moment there's some activity um, in Iceland. And in that situation, um, they are fortunate that they don't have the eruptive type of volcanoes in the strict sense of the word. So the capital Reykjavik is currently only about 20 kilometers away from where the activity is, but there's no danger at all of it being uh, damaged. So if we look at um, map of Iceland, the, the arrow actually points to, uh, in the lower left, points to the region where the uh, volcanic act activity has begun. So if we look at that more closely, the, these are where there were earthquakes um, showing that 
about a week before the first eruption, they, uh, that something was happening. And indeed, uh, what's happened by now is there have been four eruptions, essentially, in the sense that there have been four breaks in the crust. And in four places, material, lava, is flowing out. So I wondered now if I could go over live to one of the webcams. There's a couple of webcams set up showing what's happening now at this very moment. Um, I think I'll have to stop my, um, how do we do this? Uh, if I'll try and escape, that won't do it. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking for, Can, have you lost the vision now? We're still seeing the PowerPoint. Yes, you haven't selected. Oh, you can, oh. <laughs> That's the advert, by the way. Sorry about that. I think you need to press the shift okay. button again and then click on the video. Yeah, they, you have to, they force you to watch the ads. So here we are. This is, um, this is, it's quite dramatic when you see this at night time in a few hours time, but um, I hope you can see that. There's Richard, Richard, no sorry. <laughs> you're not showing us, we're still seeing the PowerPoint. You'll have to get into the share screen button uh, again. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah. Oh, you, didn't, you didn't see any of that before then? No. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I'll tell you why later. <laughs> right, so new share, right? Uh, no, stop sharing screen and then start again. Okay, I'm just, I, I thought if I go to, it's that, that one. You, you just stop the share, there you are. Okay, pause share, stop share, right, share screen, right. Um, any good? No good? Yes, we can yes. see it. Ah, right, okay. Okay, good. Okay, um, so what you've got here is in live is one, two, three, uh, four fissures that have opened up since about March the 19th. And um, these are examples of effusive volcanoes where um, the crust is so thin in Iceland, it's near a mid ocean ridge. Uh, in fact, it's an extension of that. And so if the crust breaks, um, lava will start to flow up. And what's, what they're a bit concerned about is that this lava is actually coming from a very great depth of about up to 20 kilometers, just like the mid-ocean ridges. And it's possible because of that, that it will go on for many years. But they, they don't think it's going to be a problem uh, for Reykjavik, but we'll see. Okay, now I'll just explain about it, uh, explosive volcanoes because essentially the volcanoes, the cryovolcanoes on the comet are of the explosive type. So we, we need to think why, why it is that they're explosive. And I'll tell you later when, we, when I show you some of the observations and the results of the comet, uh, but I'll just explain, it's not, it's not commonly known, you know, why, uh, in the public's mind as to what it is that causes the eruption. Now, uh, but volcanoes are often dormant because the, the central plug, as it's called, is, is actually solid at the top. It's sealed off by, because a, an eruption has happened in the past, many eruptions, but then it stops and the rock cools and it seals itself. But what, what then happens is that the, the molten magma is actually close to the crust of the earth and comes into contact with things like limestone or, uh, or hydrated minerals, water bearing. And the water and the carbon dioxide from the rock actually is liberated. And the water, mainly the water, it is CO2 as, as well from the rocks. The water dissolves in the molten rock. So the molten rock is very, very hot. 
but it acts as a, to dissolve the water, right, the steam, and the water, a lot of it dissolves into the molten rock. And while there's a pressure ahead of the uh, volcano several kilometers, it's all hunky-dory and nothing happens. But if, if the, the amount of the, um, it's a, essentially it's water gas dissolved in molten rock. If the amount of that gas gets too great, then the pressure increases and increases and eventually it's enough to push the plug out and you get an explosive eruption. And that's, and, and as the pressure drops, it's like as though a, you're opening a cork from a champagne bottle. But it's, in that case, it's CO2 in, in water. And, um, and the CO2 comes out in, in an effervescence that's sort of explosive, and that's called exsolution. And that process will happen if you get a gas dissolved in a liquid and held under pressure. So a champagne bottle is one, but so is a volcano, amazingly. So I bet, I bet most people didn't realize that. And, and there's all sorts of intermediates in between, depending on how much you know, gas, CO2, and there are other things, as other gases as well can be in there, dissolved, like hydrogen sulfide, sulfur dioxide, and so on. Okay, now I'm going to try and go back to the PowerPoint. So I think I'll probably have to stop share, um, find my PowerPoint. Uh, current slide. I'm done. This is going to work. Is that okay? No, we're back with PowerPoint. Great. Uh, uh, hold on a second. Um, oh, I see. That's it. That's it. Okay. That's, that's where we got to. Okay, so that's the Earth. That's just saying something about volcanoes in general and things that you know you might have a, a feel for, but not knowing that it's the gases that are dissolved in the, in the molten rock that causes explosive eruptions. So let's go and uh, look about Io. How, uh, what happened? It was Voyager when Voyager One passed um, passed the Jovian system on its way out of the solar system. Um, there was a a, a young um, intern a student called uh, Linda Morabito, whose job it was to um, to help find navigate the uh, trajectory of the of Voyager by taking pictures of the stars and pictures of the satellites of Jupiter with the stars in the background. So you're doing a long exposures with the stars in the background. And what she did is that she she found on the Vidicon display this picture up on the top left. And she thought, first of all, that it was just one of the other satellites that was ha just happened to be you know, in the same line of sight and just behind Io. But it soon very quickly dawned on her that it wasn't, and that it was in fact a volcano erupting on, on the, just over the horizon in Io. And when they use the main camera on Voyager to image it, this is what it, they saw. Um, of course, it was on a trajectory on a flyby, so it, it, it couldn't take a long look at it. It just was snapping them as it went past, a bit like New Horizons going past Pluto. And, um, and, and that was it. And it was really, well, it wasn't actually such a surprise because a paper had been published the year before um, Voyager got there, predicting that it would have volcanoes. And so they were dead right. Now let's have a look at some of the numbers. So when, when I was thinking about Io, Pairing it with the Earth and also uh, Comet 29P. So what I've done is I've just put a few numbers up, um, just to, uh, oops, sorry, just to show you um, the differences. So um, 
the Earth, of course, is very large, but Io is quite big as well. Um, and Io goes round very quickly every 41, 42 hours, a bit like the way the Earth turns. And Io keeps one face pointing uh, at Jupiter, like the Moon does the Earth. And so it has this tide, it's the, tide the tides have locked it. It's been locked into that position. Um, and it's in synchronicity with the other Galilean satellites as well. They're all lo locked in, all in, at equilibrium. So it will go on for billions of years now. But um, one difference between a comet and these two objects, the Earth and Io, is that a comet is very black. It's very dark. So the albedo, as we call it, is very low. So any heat from the sun that shines on it gets absorbed. Most of it gets absorbed. And one of the things I'll... Um, that I published a paper on was the fact that it appears to have a periodicity of in the outbursts, which is around about nearly 58 days. And the hypothesis is that it actually takes 58 days or 1,385 hours to actually turn once on it, spit once on its axis. And this has something to do with why it is cryovolcanically active, because the days on 29P, if it is indeed that very slow spinning is, is actually the equivalent of several weeks on the Earth. So if you're if you were sitting on 29p, you know you'd have to wait in a you know, 29 day. Uh, yeah, that's that's coincidence, isn't it? 29 days for the sun to rise and then set. 29 of our days, and you can imagine that the heat that can be absorbed by the surface. But the interesting story is that is the night time. The nights are also 29 days long of our days. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. Now, we don't know what the density of the comet, but the comets are usually around about one, uh, not as dense. But we can work out roughly the escape velocity and the gravity. And it's roughly, given its size, uh, 64 kilometers or so across, it's roughly a thousand times lower gravity than on the Earth. And that's sufficiently less that the escape velocity is actually not that high. So if it thinks of traveling at more than 25 meters per second, the material will just disappear and get and end up in interstellar interplanetary space. Now Galileo, the the uh, not the uh, discoverer of the Galilean satellites, but the probe named after him, Galileo, was uh, actually uh, imaged Io. Uh, and was able to take a, this is a video, I hope you can see it's moving, but it's a bit like a, a, a fountain. It's just a, a, something like eight frames uh, speeded up, which show that um, because the, the gravity of Io is quite strong, any of the volcanoes on Io cannot throw material into outer space. It all falls back again. And of course, the Earth is likewise, you know, it's in fact, it's quite rare for a volcano to eject material into the stratosphere. It normally doesn't get beyond the troposphere. But when it does, when it gets into the stratosphere, then the dust and the uh, pollution actually could travel all the way around the Earth. And the, the El Chican eruption in 1982 in South America, uh, two years later, the material had gone around the Earth several times and then traversed from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere and caused a lot of uh, obscuration for observers, for astronomers. Um, but uh, on Io, again, the gravity is sufficient to make the material fall back. Now, here's some other physical properties. Uh, you know, we need to think, what's the difference between Io and 29P? Well, Io doesn't, although it doesn't have uh, any atmosphere very much. Its gravity stops the material escaping. But 29P has no atmosphere whatsoever. The temperature out there uh, beyond near Jupiter is around about 130 Kelvin. So that's uh, very cold. Um, and in the nighttime, on the nighttime side of Io, it gets to as low as 40 Kelvin. And actually, they find that the night and the day has an influence on the volcano volcanic activities. So um, that's something that, that is particularly marked in the case of Comet 29P. Now, um, 
in terms of the eruptions, there's something like 45 active volcanoes on the Earth at any one time. Um, and on Io, the, there's something like 12 that are actually active. But in the case of 29P, it goes between activity, sudden eruption, and then everything switching off again. And the eruptions are very short lived of 29P, as we'll see, whereas in the case of the Earth and Io, they go on and on until um, something gives and some pressure is given away. And um, I hypothesize that in the, the molten fluid beneath the crust of the comet, to be molten at these very low temperatures, it has to be have a hydrocarbon base. So things like methane, ethane, propane. And the active gas that which remember I, I said that gases are responsible for explosive eruptions. The active gases in, in the case of 29P is very much e likely to be carbon monoxide and nitrogen. And carbon monoxide is, is present throughout, um, throughout the galaxy in, in molecular clouds. It's a very common constituent and nitrogen. Uh, like Pluto is a, a lot of frozen nitrogen. Uh, on, on its surface. Um, and the thing, the difference again between 29p is that most of the material, because of the low escape velocity, escapes from the comet. Okay. Just, I'll just very quickly finish looking at Io. Io's main vo volcanoes are these listed here, and as their actual center is well over a thousand degrees, so it's possible to take images of Io. Um, and if you take the one on the left is in uh, visible light, but the one on the right, if you take the image in infrared, I don't think x-rays would show anything, but infrared certainly, you can see the hot spots. So that's, that's all I want to say about Aya. And now in the talk, I, I want to actually, I've got to convince you actually, I don't think you're sitting there. I know, I can't see you all, I can't see what you're up to, but I don't think some of you believe what I'm saying. I think there's a bit of a, I've got to convince, the job now is to convince you that this is, the, the activity we see from this so-called comet is actually due to cryovolcanoes. So that's what I'll try and do in the rest of the talk. Now, uh, oh, oh yeah, there's a, there's a picture of Io um, as you would normally see it. As to what 29P looks like, well, um, we can talk about that at the very end of the talk. And, um, a space probe is a way to find out. Okay, so now let's 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 try and I'll try and raise awareness of Comet 29P. And back in 2017, I gave a talk in um, Pasadena at a, a professional meeting where I presented all the latest information as it was then about the comet. And a uh, a journalist um, wanted uh, to know about that, and she put a, an article out on in Astronomy Magazine on the on their online um, version of their magazine and it was called are there volcanoes on comets so back in 2017 people weren't even then weren't convinced and i know you're not convinced you haven't heard enough to 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 make you uh, believe this okay right now what i'll show you next is um is what we call the light curves of the of the observations of the comet. And most of the, the data for these are obtained by amateur observers because you have to, to watch things, wait for them to erupt and things like that. You've got to keep watching as often as you can and see what's happening. And the thing about a light curve is it plots the magnitude on the y-axis, dense of time on the x-axis. And the magnitudes are, um, I know we're used to using them, but they're actually a logarithmic scale. So if something is five magnitudes brighter than something else, it's actually a hundred times brighter. So it's a little bit misleading when you look at a light curve and you plot it as a magnitude. So here's um, an overview of what we call the apparition of the 29P during, uh, on three occasions. So the, the comet is a bit like Jupiter, really, because it's so close to Jupiter and because it's in a circular orbit, you actually see it 
just as though you were observing Jupiter. So it's actually visible for about three quarters of the time. And it only disappears for a relatively short time as it goes into solar conjunction. So these are three apparitions, which last about uh, a year. And um, it shows the magnitudes over time. And I think what you'd say when you looked at that is that uh, that's not random, that what you're seeing isn't, isn't random. And as we went on, as time went on, we got to observe it in more detail, start to pick out more detail. But in 2014, which is the first one, that was the, when I published uh, the article uh, in the literature where I identified a periodicity that was about 58 days. But also, I, I, it was then that we discovered that as well as these strong outbursts, um, it actually has lots of little ones. And these weren't picked up before. You see these wiggles, and there's more there. These are what I call mini outbursts. And if, if, um, if you look at this on a, instead of plotting it as a magnitude, as you plot it as a linear intensity instead of magnitude. So if you look at this bottom one here, the next, the next slide is that, but shown as a linear plot. And at the top, you can see here the brightness enhancement goes from one no, when it's um, before an eruption to 81 at the top there. So what you're seeing, you know, this is 80 times brighter than just the nucleus alone. So go back to what it was. So these two, these two down here are, are those two there plotted on a linear scale. And if you take that and then expand the scale by a factor of nine, you get the bottom and you start to see these mini outbursts. And what, what you get is you get a very sudden change that it takes about an hour or two hours for this to go from quiescence to maximum light. So it's a very sudden thing. You might have to wait several weeks, but it's very sudden when it happens. And that's why I'm talking about an explosive eruption. And that's why we talk about volcanicity. It's not just squeezing out a bit like the Icelandic volcano, just, just um, appearing gradually over time. It, it, it shuts out and then it shuts down. So what happens is if you, if you open a bottle of a cork from a bottle of champagne, um, as, the, as the gas and the liquid comes out, you actually it takes heat from the liquid and the liquid gets colder the, the the actual temperature of the champagne is lower once you've let the cork out than before you took the cork out and that's because the the eruption the, the x solution as it's called takes heat it's like as though it's evaporating suddenly it's it's like as though it provided the heat but the heat is taken from the liquid and that's the case out you know at this comet but when the material comes out, there's no more pressure to drive it. It loses pressure, it cools colder, and the fluid freezes over and plugs itself. And it seems as though that it closes off within minutes of the initial eruption, which is really fascinating. Oh yeah, there's a, a close-up of the, the mini outbursts. You see, you see the characteristic shape. This, What's happening is getting brighter, uh, and then you have to measure the brightness with a certain size aperture. And in time, some of the material escaping goes beyond the aperture. And so the measurement you get gets less and less as the coma gets more and more diffuse. Right. Now, bringing it more up to date, I've shown you three apparitions. Well, here's the apparitions up and till the current one. So it's 2017, 2018, and 2019. And, and see the strange behavior of it. Now this, this makes you wonder, okay, you get an eruption, but look what's happening. You get one eruption and it seems as though an eruption can trigger another one. And you've got to come up with a, a theory as to why it is that that might happen. And what we're finding in the more recent observations is that Although I say the material escapes from, from the comet, in fact, quite a lot of material falls back as well. And it's the fallback 
of material that probably provokes and triggers more, more eruptions of areas with, on the surface where there's been pressure underneath, but it just hasn't had, had been disturbed. And remember I said that the, the material that come, of the comet is very black. Well, it turns out that the, the fluid, this liquid hydrocarbon that's there, when that freezes, it actually looks like wax. It's paraffin wax and say solid methane that solidifies when it gets very cold are exactly the same. They're the same chemicals. It's just they're different molecular weights. And so you now try to think of the, the molten lava as like wax. And the, and the wax is, it doesn't break all of a sudden, it gets softened. So if it warms up, it gradually gets softened and eventually it gives way. So that's his way of thinking about maybe what's happening out there. Now, this is the, uh, the latest, uh, this year's, not quite up to date. I'll show you the website at the very end. And this is what's been happening uh, since June last year. And we've had, um, well, we've had three really strong eruptions and lots of small ones. And where I've pointed the arrows there, Remember I said that some material falls back. Well, these are cases uh, that are example cases of where that's happened. And I'll show you a plot which of one of them to explain more, in more detail. But one thing that we've always been trying to do since, well, since 2014 is to try to catch one of these eruptions as it happens. Now, You've got three big ones here, three bright ones. We've caught one or two of the mini outbursts, but we never caught a bright one. And you can imagine why, because they're over and done with in an hour, virtually, or a few hours. And there's only three in all of the year. So what are the odds are you going to, you know, when you're, you're taking your pictures of, 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 of this comet, keeping your fingers crossed that something's going to happen? <laughs> it's like, it's almost as a, you know, waiting for lightning to strike, you know, it's, it, although, well, you know, it does, lightning does strike and it does kill people and it does, and, and things which you think are very unlikely, like the, the meteor that came in and landed at Winchcombe and landed on the drive and it's a very rare meteorite. These things do happen in reality, but if you don't look, you'll never find, find it. And um, what happened was uh, this eruption here, um, I work, I've, since 2014, I've been working with a, a particularly keen French amateur. There's, there's quite a party, quite, quite a group of amateurs who were observing 29P and trying to see these eruptions. But back in November the 19th, my colleague, uh, oh, just, uh, my colleague, uh, he's in France. He actually has built an observatory, which I've, I've visited, which is dedicated to observe this comet. If the comet is above the horizon and it's clear, his telescope is a robotic telescope and it takes pictures of it. And this is it. It's, it's, uh, so it's Jean-Francois Soulier is the guy's name. He lives in the north of France, but he's set up this telescope in Haute-Provence on the south where you get lots of clear sky. And um, he has this, it's an uh, eight inch, um, uh, Newtonian, but it's all fully automated, so he can operate it from home. So it's great. And um, what he did on November nineteenth, he's although the Mistral was blowing, it was a very windy day. He was he he set the thing going, and the first well, the first I knew about this event on November nineteenth is when I. So on my email, I had an, an email from Nick James, the director of the BAA comment section. He just happened to be um, be observing 29P and he noticed that it was about two magnitudes brighter than it had been the day before. Now there's an article in the latest BAA journal that's just come out where you can read a bit more about it. But it's partly that Nick was observing and he, he sent an alert out, certainly to me, and I was just, keeping my well what what he said was that it was actually getting brighter as he was observing it so that told him that it was actually in the process of an eruption and it turns out that 
it actually started exactly 30 minutes before he started observing it. Now, Jean-Francois, who, <laughs> you know, he's, he's really on the ball and he set his going 45 minutes before the eruption. So he had got, he takes a one minute images, every one minute he'd take an image um, and downloads it. And, um, and he's got a, essentially eight hours worth of these one minute images. He had to, sh well, they shut down part for a short time just when the wind got too strong, but he overrode them it manually and, and forced it to keep observing. And um, what he got uh, was a video. And um, that's, uh, that's the field of view. But what I'll try and do now is I'll pause sharing, I'll switch to the video and, um, and I'll, um, I'll play the video if I can. Let's have a look. Um, Well, you won't see it just yet. I'll just get it lined up, ready to start. Okay. Share screen. Uh, that must be it there. Right. Can you see? Can you see that? <laughs> Good. This is the comet here, right? And it's moving, you know, across the sky in this direction. In fact, it heads off crosses that star there, goes along there, crosses that galaxy, and his observation finishes over here. So this has never been done before, where this comet is sort of magnitude 16, and it's quiescent, and he actually has got a video. I don't think it'll be done again for quite some years, uh, just like I don't think a meteorite will land on someone's drive for quite a few more years. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll run it directly. And you'll see it move across and then you'll see it get brighter there's the eruption and now it's throwing the material out into space and it's traveling across the sky i'll see if i can manually control that so if we we run it back we can actually so at this point at this point here the eruption happens but because jean francois has got has got this data we're able to actually analyze the light curve and study what's going on and it splits up into three sections in the first bit um, you've got an opaque cloud that just gets bigger and bigger and that makes it get brighter but then what happens is the cloud becomes what's called optically thin as gaps appear between it and uh, you, could, you know if you were shining a light from behind you start to see the light coming through it okay and and, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until all of the particles are all well spaced and it can't no more you know nothing extra can get it's um so if you follow the uh, it eventually reaches a maximum brightness and that's when all the particles have, aren't overlapping anymore they're, they're, it's optically perfectly thin and th and then what happens is the expanding um cloud gets bigger and bigger physically it doesn't get any brighter though. So that's uh, that's the video. So um, I think so that's it um, in real time. Okay. Now let's uh, go back to uh, if I can find the and you know. Right. Um, and this is the light curve that I generated from from that. You can. This is in magnitude. So. Um, 
This is it for the 45 minutes round about magnitude 16. And what we're able to do is to get the shape of this really accurately. So this is sort of about, um, what is it, uh, about eight hours. And you see how it reaches a maximum bright, brightness. Well, as well as Jean-Francois' observations, we, you know, at the time, uh, it wasn't that far from opposition, and we were we were having a bit of an observing campaign. So we got a lot of other observers, and the fact that Nick James alerted everybody meant that a lot of people stayed up late that night and kept observing it. So we actually got the next slide shows about it. Oh, there's the oh, that was the um, that was the appearance of it just 19 hours after the initial eruption. Can you see? It's, it's not quite a complete circle. It's got that notch out of it, again, characteristic. And, and this is what you, the light curve looked at. If you looked at 10 days or eight days worth of observations, this is it just fading from a previous uh, activity. Uh, then the sudden rise. And then we measure it with a certain size aperture, which um, this line here marks the point at which the material starts to go beyond the aperture. But one of the things that we discovered was that you can see it just up here. You've got, you would normally expect that to just sort of be a single maximum. But what you've got is like a notch cut out of it. And what is that's likely to be is that some of the material that's been thrown out into space is actually water ice. And it takes a couple of days for the water ice to sublimate away. And, and so that's the water disappearing from the cloud, and turning into a gas and then just vanishing effectively. And then it fades down. And then by the end of the period, there was another outburst after it. But by at this point here, I think there's a picture. This is what it looked like um, over five days later. Um, so it's this one here. Uh, and you see the shape, you see that notch. And that's, as I say, because um, you get eruption in this direction. And because the nucleus is so big, it, material can't go that way. So you end up with this characteristic shape. Okay, then, right. Just got about five more slides. W one thing I want to just finish with is to um, talk about this fallback, because it turns out that the fallback of some material it doesn't all disappear into interplanetary space. Uh, some of it drops back. And in fact, it's the fallback that creates the crust that enables it to seal and create a, have a magma. It's called a cryomagma. It's at only about 90 degrees Kelvin, but it's, it's liquid. And it's the, the fallback of material that's continually rebuilding the crust. And it's the nighttime, actually, the long nights that help to solidify that crust and hold, it, hold the pressure. So what I want to do is to see if we can, oh, there's the, uh, this is just the velocity profile across the, um, this is the amount of material in the coma, and this is the speed at which it's coming out. So you see that it goes up to say 200 meters per second, and the gas goes fastest. But anything below about 25 meters per second, this fraction here, around about 15, percent of it all falls back again because it's not traveling fast enough to go beyond escape velocity. And what I'm going to show you last, lastly is some observations where you can actually see this stuff fall back. But you have to do it with photometry. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at it's there's the the, the strong outburst I was talking about. We're going to look at this section here in more detail. And what you get are these, you can see these sudden outbursts. So these are what we call mini outbursts. And the thing is getting fainter and fainter. And um, what you can do is you can measure the coma, the brightness close up to the nucleus. You need to get, have a, preferably have a large telescope to do that. And um, so I'll have to explain the last plot in a bit of this in a bit more detail. Right. What we're showing here is effectively a magnitude. It's called a reduced magnitude because we have to express it in a standard way so that you're comparing like with like. So you just compare it as though it was one AU from the Earth and one AU from the Sun and, and so on. 
and you compare the brightness. So you measure the brightness in an aperture. You put the aperture on the comet and you use different size apertures to find out how bright it is for different sizes. And the sizes down here are expressed as uh, the radius of the aperture in thousands of kilometers. Okay, so um, what these are mainly taken with a two meter telescope. So the time here, T plus, is the time after the outburst. So it starts off fainter, it gets suddenly brighter within a matter of hours. And if you look at the time, you have to wait a couple of days before something to change. And what then changes very quickly after going from two days to four days to seven days, what happens is this light, the, the brightness of the coma changes because material is falling back onto the nucleus all this time. And it's getting fainter because of that. But the bright, the bit that's contributed by the bit very close to the nucleus, which is about to fall back, is creating light. But as it falls back, it disappears from view, and the, and the brightness drops quite quickly, and then it stays constant. In fact, this, if you extrapolate this one here, you end up always with it all on this line here, and down here is the brightness of the nucleus, as though there were no coma around it. So you extrapolate it to zero radius. And this is the brightness it would have if there was no coma. So it all ties in. A lot of the material falls back and it's that material that's responsible for producing the crust, like the crust you know, on the Icelandic volcanoes or the plug plugging you know, Mount Vesuvius and stopping another explosive eruption. It's, it's the, this fallback onto, a, onto the surface that is creating its own crust. And during the nighttime, the liquid seeps up into the, into the crust and solidifies and, and, and actually holds it together. And interestingly enough, we now think that the, the eruptions happen soon after the sun rises on the nucleus. So if you're looking at the moon, for example, at the terminator, that's when heat starts building up at the surface of the moon. But it's the same as on a comet. When, when the comet spins and a potential volcano volcano, crow volcano comes out into view, the sun shines on it. And that's the critical time when quite a lot of these eruptions take place. And that's why we can identify a periodicity. And the last um, plot is showing what happens if you look at all the eruptions we've seen since 2002, and you, you fit it to a certain rotation period for the nucleus. And that way you can map you like create a, a time map of the surface. And this is what you get. And this isn't a random, each of the white the spots is, a, is an, it's an eruption, is an outburst. And the, the brighter the spot, the stronger the outburst. And what you see is that the, the ones where I've connected in green is where an eruption has happened one rotation later. So it's turned once. So one, you know, you've had an eruption in one place and it goes and erupts a second time. And, and the ones in red are the ones where you get one triggering another one. So we saw those groups of outbursts. So you get one and then that, that triggers another one, that triggers another one. Um, and so that's basically, you know, all I wanted to say. Uh, and to finish off with, um, I call the I call the observing campaign now Mission Twenty Nine P because um, as last year the applications went in for the well, to NASA for space space projects probes going out into the solar system. This is called the Discovery Program, and um, there were two groups that put in proposals to visit Comet Twenty Nine P. One group was the group that sent the probe past Pluto, the New Horizons probe. They wanted to send a probe past 29P and some of the other objects out there. So as it flies by, it's going to record what it saw. And then this group, um, they, their idea was they put a probe in orbit around the comet and study it, a bit like Rosetta. Uh, both of them were turned down. Both were turned down. 
So I, I decided, well, amateurs can observe the comet and we will uh, do more in future. And so for the last um, a year or so, we've been observing it and finding a lot more out about the comet. Um, and I'll stop sharing. And I'll just see if I can go over to the website to show you the, the Mission 29P uh, website. Um, where is it? There we go. So, right, um, back to, um, hold on, hold on. Uh, share screen. Right, this, this is the, the website on the comet section webpage. So I, sh I should be able to scroll down it, I think. So um, it, it tells you all there, what all about it. I've shown you some of these things here. These are some of the outbursts we've been seeing, other different pictures of it, um, more outbursts. These outbursts are only about 0.1 of a magnitude. And it's because so many amateurs are observing it that we're able to see these small effects. And these things, when it's so weak in outbursts, it never ever escapes into space. It all falls back. It all falls back onto the surface. And these are all the outbursts we've we've seen listed here. Hers, hers the light curve I've shown you that Jean-Francois was able to get. Um, and this is the uh, the latest uh, the latest light curve brought up to date. And there's been an outburst quite recently. Um, yeah. And all the results and so on, all the people's observations all get put there in real time. And you can see the late, the last one that's down is for April the 12th. So basically, you know, if you're a, an observer and you're interested in this, uh, we've just come to the end of the season now. And, um, and so it's too late. It's got too close to the sun. But come August, September next year, uh, this later this year, we'll be starting up again, and uh, you're welcome to uh, to observe and join the campaign. And if not, uh, just dip into the website and and have a look and see how things are going. So thanks for listening. Um, I will uh, I will finish there. Great. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, any yeah. questions? <laughs> no questions, but I'm sorry. I've never actually heard of comets. I said, people, well, it's fascinating stuff. It's amazing. I, I reckon if it would be called Halley's Comet, everybody yeah. would know about it because it's such a uh, such a bad name, it's such an, a difficult name. Nobody remembers it or thinks it of any interest. So what's in the name? You know, when you when you christen your children. It's important what you call them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll remember it because my birthday is the 29th. Ah, good. Thank December. You. I'll remember 29p. I want to hear Alice Amanda say it again. <laughs> I noticed I didn't actually say it. I just said 29 Hold on. Shu Vashman. Vachman. Yeah, that's pretty good. Schwarzman, you can say it more quickly though, Schwarzman Bachman. Schwarzman Bachman. I always remember Martin Mobley, who used to make it, make, who was, used to make a show of the name. <laughs> yeah. I was just relieved I pronounced it right. <laughs> yeah. I think we'll hear more about it. It's a shame that there's not been a space probe for it because essentially, uh, although I'm putting forward all these sort of theories, as you might call them, Nobody really knows, and until you go and visit these things, you really can't be sure what what's there. But if you did go and visit, it would be quite uh, quite something. I've had conversations with uh, professional astronomers, and um, they, you know, they said one of the things that puts them off is they're worried about the probe being de you know deactivated by an outburst. It might be taken out by an outburst. But nowadays, what they do is they send. It's a bit like perseverance. They send yeah. other things with it, you know, helicopter or that's what they do with 29P. They'll send the main probe, 
but then they'll send a few like drones to go down onto the surface and 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 sort of hop around to see what's going on and if one of them gets written off it's not the end of the end of the mission but is anybody convinced that there's you know the question is am i any further forward are you any more believing that there are cryovolcanoes on this object and it's not really a comet it's actually a centaur object that's got itself you know trapped now anybody anybody anyone believe any of that rubbish <laughs> Oh, you convinced me. Yeah. Oh, no, thanks. I got, <laughs> I got one, one. <laughs> yeah. But the professionals are very stuck in their ways. Really, it's difficult. Often, um, you know, if they, if it's not their subject, and most professional astronomers haven't done chemistry or physics. Well, they haven't done chemistry. And and I spent. I remember, I, I, I was a scientist working for Shell, the old company. So things like methane, ethane, propane, and all of this stuff, it's all sort of bread and butter. And it's also obvious to me, but uh, anyway, I've, it's all out there published essentially in, in the literature. And I now just need to popularize it. And one of the reasons I'd like to, you know, like talking to guys like yourselves is that it's the start of popularizing the thing and making people realize, you know, these, the solar system is more wonderful than than you'd, you'd ever think, really. There's strange things happening in all sorts of places mm -hmm. out there. And that, that comet is, isn't really a comet, but it's well worth a visit by a space probe. And, and yeah. has anybody got a, a, a question? Oh, sorry, I'm going on too much. John? There's David, David's got one. He's got his hand up. David Archibald. No, it's John Murrow. Oh, I see, sorry. Right. Let's go with John Murrow. <laughs> John, the, you're not showing he's muted, but we can't hear you. Are you, are you muted? No, uh, he's not muted. No, oh, okay. Well, go on then. I've turned up my volume. Where's, where's John Murrow? Are you there, John? Uh, I don't think your microphone's working because you're certainly not muted. Can you use chat? Maybe type it out. Oh, that's a point, yeah. Yeah. In the meantime, Richard, is there any other sort of theories? If it wasn't uh, volcanoes that are causing these outbursts, is there any other theories that people have come up with? Uh, okay, yeah, that's a good, good, good uh, question. Yeah, because being a proper scientist, you have to consider all the possibilities. You know, mm -hmm. it's only like Sherlock Holmes when everything else can't be possible that the the impossible becomes the answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so some of the impossible things that uh, have been suggested. Uh, some of the impossible things that suggested is that back in 1973, there was a paper published in the astronomy literature because somebody had spotted a thing called amorphous ice in the chemical literature. That had been published in the 60s. The astronomers got latched onto it in the 70s. And ever since, they've, been, they've had this idea that you can, because you can have amorphous ice in a very created in a very cold environment, the ice can then turn to a crystalline ice. And when it does that, it gives out a little bit of heat. And they've got so latched onto an idea that they've, they've, it's a bit like the epicycles that were created before Copernicus finally, you know, pointed mm -hmm. out that the sun is in the center of the solar system. People have been using this crystallization process is to try to explain everything. And it's just impossible to explain 29P because you can't have, so much activity, so much energy. And I, you know, I could give a talk about the chemistry and, and so on of that, but I, but I won't. Cause, uh, <laughs> but it, it's all, it all can be explained. And um, yeah, I'll, I've still got some more things to write. Now then, um, John's question. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> right. John, no, no. John muted himself again. Oh yeah, I can sit here, but I can see all the all the things, right? Okay. Waiting for you, John. Yeah. Now he's talking. His first questions. He was. If you look at the chat, he's he's got the thing. He said he's actually asked the question: Is there a spectra of the coma to indicate what the material is? Okay. Right. Now, 
uh, when we get the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, we'll be able to have um, reflectance spectra and, and, and so on. But the emission spectra, because it's 6 AU from the sun and the, the sun's power is sort of 36 times less than the Earth, the emission spectra isn't so strong. But there are spectra um, done and um, they, they can see the, well, let's, Hubble has been used. Um, Herschel Space Telescope has been used in the infrared and the Russians have used a six meter on it to do spectra. The Russians have actually got some good spectra of the nitrogen and the carbon monoxide. Um, the um, Hubble, ah, no, Hubble got a, a limit, a faint limit to the water, but Herschel's, Herschel managed to detect water in there. Um, but no, the, the problem is that um, you have to get it just at the right time, just after an outburst and, you know, because the gas effectively just disappears, you know, it travels at uh, a particular speed that's characteristic of its temperature. And even at the temperature it's at out there, it still is moving at sort of 500 meters per second. So unless you get it early on, you won't okay. get a decent spectrum. So that's the problem with that. You do need to, to visit the place. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, John says, um, when I was showing the, um, the eruptions, the lava flows coming out of the Icelandic volcano, he said, there looks to be a new lava flow on the left near the volcano known as Bob. Yeah, uh, I think there might be a fifth one. That's right. There's somebody yesterday evening was pointed that out as well, that there's two close together. Um, so it's, it's a very, you know, developing situation, that volcanic activity in Ireland. And um, there, as I said before, there's a, a theory that it might go on for even years. Um, there is one of the volcanoes in Caribbean has been going on for a long time. Is it Sam McQuillan? Um, but, um, you know, and Edna goes on for a long time as well. But the ones on um, the comet, they definitely switch off. Um, it's interesting the way in which they, they, they close down. Uh, and it is very much really like, it's much more like a champagne cork being chucked out. Uh, because once the gas, uh, once it's all very, you know, there's, it's close to the surface. Once the gas is escaped, it cools it and then it freezes and it stops. But in the case of the earth, the source of the lava are kilometers, tens of kilometers deep. And there's just a, a complete, you know, infinite supply, almost. And the thing that causes an eruption to stop or restart, you know, we're not really privy to know physically what's going on that's, that's, that's controlling it in such a, because we can't probe what's happening deep down. And that, that's the difficulty with the comet, really, to, you know, to, the other thing I say to professionals is this, that this object came from beyond Pluto. This object came from the trans-Neptunian area. And what it's done, it's come, you know, five times closer. It, it's come, it's spewing out its insides, showing what, what, what it's made of. And you're not taking notice of it to go and visit it, you know, to see what it is. Instead, you know, you're trying to use eight meter, or 10 meter telescopes to observe trans-Neptunian objects and they're just faint fuzzy blobs of light. But if you send a probe to this one, you'll get to understand what, you know, in real detail, what a trans-Neptunian object really, one of them is composed of. And that's the biggest argument. But um, I'm actually told, I'm, I'm, I'm giving a talk to the BAA uh, in a month's time on the BAA webinar. And I've invited a lady from California who's a professional astronomer, who was one of the team that put the proposal to orbit 29P. And she's going to do 10 or 15 minutes, uh, hopefully tell us a little bit about what their plans were. But I am told that um, quite often what happens, what NASA does, is they reject things when they first propose. But if you, it's a bit like anything in this life, if you're really keen and you go back again and you go and give more reasons why you should do something, they then will change their mind. But um, so I'm getting a bit too long in the tooth to, to be here when the probe get, gets to the comet. So <laughs> I, can't, I can't keep waiting too long. But uh, hopefully um, Laura, Laura um, 
Woodney, her name's Laura Woodney, uh, she'll um, she'll say a bit from the professional point of view as to why, you know, Comet 29P is w worthy of our interest. So yeah, more more to go, more, more to hear about it. Uh, because John John was saying that the a lot more people there now at the Iceland Volcano, uh, including police. Yeah, I don't know. Is my microphone working now? Yeah. Yes. I, mm. oh, I, I fought it back from Microsoft Teams and captured it. No, sorry about that. <laughs> too many, too oh. many meetings. Yeah, is the, is the um, if you have a look at the volcano site, it's getting quite good now as the darkness forms. But pretty busy and you can see some more of the there's a lot of lava about I'll, I'll tell you something funny john that happened you know i um went over to the uh to uh, to fl was there, there are two cameras there's bob there, there's two cameras one's called bob isn't it and one's called yes Flo. and um i think i went over to flow when you go to youtube they always show an advert for the first yes. five. well the advert that came on was semi-naked women Selling brassiers, honest. Yes. <laughs> you guys couldn't see it. I thought that's going to destroy my reputation. <laughs> that, that, that hasn't happened. You couldn't see it. <laughs> I hate to say that. That's been on quite often. Oh, has it? I first There's another that. one of women doing strange exercises as well. Oh, right. That's YouTube for you. <laughs> it's to encourage, uh, you know, we should have videos that encourage more women to watch. Mm. I mean, it does. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, it'd be interesting, volcanicity of volcanoes, and certainly <coughs> follow the Icelandic ones, because uh, it's worth going on holiday there, isn't it? I've not been, but my son's been, and I'm sure one or two of you guys might have. It's it's well worth going. I hate to mention it, I, I was there shortly after Surtsey formed in 1963, and you flew over it in a light aircraft. You flew over it? Yes. Oh, wow. That and it was only about... A, a, under a year old at the time, but of course it's gradually disappearing now. Yeah, it's washing away. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, it was quite a minor event, really. Uh, hmm. What do you think is going to happen with this uh, this one? Don't know. It, it might go on for quite a long time. So they haven't had one of these for a long time, there, have they? This um, shield volcano. Yeah, they they said that's right. They said that if it's indeed coming from twenty kilometers down. They haven't had one for thousands and thousands of years. Not You're not in that area, but there's, do you remember there was one two years ago that was about 20 or 30 times as big as this north of the glacier? Yeah. That apparently was deep lava as well, and that stopped after about six months or a year. Oh, did it? Okay, that's useful to know. So maybe a holiday in, a, in two years' time will be okay. There'll probably be another one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, anyway, I hope, I hope you uh, you found it worthwhile listening. Mm. To, yeah, Thank you. Yes. That's going on. But uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me. And um, as I say, I'll, on May the 12th, it is, I've got a BAA webinar. So I'll, um, I'll have to, um, it's not mentioning about vol volcanoes and IO and all of that. So I'll keep more to the subject of astronomy, I think for that one. But as I say, I've invited and hopefully I'll, I'll have a co-presenter by way of a professional astronomer. So, so it would <coughs> be nice to, to, to hear what they have to say. Yeah, what I was going to say, Richard, was that, that um, the one that Rosetta went to, that was ejecting material, wasn't it, explosively? Okay. Um, yeah, that's called 67P, Turi yes. Gerasimenko. And... Um, it's uh, all of the um, events that they filmed from Rosetta, called it filmed, um, weren't seen from the Earth as outbursts or anything. They oh, were right. more minor of affairs. But what um, I, I've sort of half, half written a paper uh, to, because um, some of the papers, there's quite a lot of material coming, still coming out about that. But one of the things is that um, they can't explain. <laughs> At why when they do get a jet, it can keep going for so long. Mm. It can go for an hour. Like they, you know, they've got firm observations of this, so nobody yeah. can argue with it. But what they find is that a conventional source of energy can't can't power it. And so the thing that powers 29P, the principle behind it, um, also 
compare um, that. And it's all to do with what you, you'll have heard from where your school days called latent heat. Mm. So it's yeah. a, effectively, it's what it's called is latent heat. And in the case of the uh, Rosetta, the what I, I, my understanding of it is, is that there's a crust, in parts of this nucleus, there's a crust, and it holds a little bit of pressure. It doesn't need to hold much, because some of the chemicals, the hydrocarbons, <coughs> alcohol, they can be a liquid and stay liquid and held at that. Now, the thing about it, as more liquid forms and it's, it's built up in one sort of particular uh, zone, that is latent heat stored like a battery. It's like electric, you know, stored in a bat electric mm. battery. And if this crust breaks away, it can take all the latent heat that is needed to convert the liquid to freeze it back to solid to power the jet. And that's why, why it keeps going. It's actually a very, very simple <laughs> idea. And when I, back in 2012, I, um, George, George Fias and I, we published a paper called Liquids in, li uh, on the liquid phase in comets, comet nuclei. Because in 2012, nobody believed there was any liquid beneath the surface of the comet. But a long-lived jet is, is actually tantamount proof to the fact that you can only power that sort of thing by having a stock, you know, a reservoir or something to you can draw. Mm -hmm. And that's, now, in the case of 29P, the, um, it might have been a passage close to Jupiter that would have helped it, but generally produce heat inside but what happens is the heat to the sun um it actually penetrates because the days are so long it penetrates and it can convert things like nitrogen and carbon monoxide ice into the gas and in fact the temperature inside if that comet's been stuck between jupiter and saturn for a long time but there has been enough heat conducted in to convert a lot of the carbon monoxide ice into the gas Mm -hmm. And then what happens is the heat has been built up over thousands of years, but the gas diffuses around. And if it sees any hydrocarbon, it will dissolve in the hydrocarbon. And the action of dissolving in the hydrocarbon is the same as uh, something condensing in there. And, um, and so uh, once it's in there, it's then, if, if for some reason it's... It, the you know, it, it liquefy, it's a liquid hydrocarbon. When it, if the crust breaks, then the source of the energy that drives the outburst, the eruption, is actually from thousands of years ago, from the when the carbon monoxide ice turned into gas. And it's just that the gas has found itself in some liquid hydrocarbon. And once it does that, it releases, it's taken its heat with it, its latent heat has gone along with it, and is there ready to be used to power an eruption. And that, it, it's as simple as that, actually. You don't have to, and so people always thought that uh, there were never any liquids inside comets. But as soon as you start believing that there is a liquid, you, then you get all these wonderful processes that can start happening. That, that otherwise, you know, not a lot can 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 do anything in a comet, and it's it's still now the, the you'll still now see a reviews, you know, just two years old, sh trying to explain things in the in the old using the old thinking, and you just need to realize there has to be a liquid. I you 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 talk to someone and say like propane, you know, you you can buy propane for heating, and it's a liquid in a tank. Well, you know, you can you could open the tank and pour the liquid out in a, in a vessel. Now, um, if if you um, if you got the gas um, and you could, uh, that's, that's the best way to explain it. Yeah, you to be able to produce a liquid, you have to hold a certain pressure. Otherwise, it's like a vacuum and it just evaporates away. But the pressure you need to keep propane liquid is 100 millionth of an atmosphere of the Earth's atmosphere pressure, 100 millionth of the Earth's atmosphere pressure. And there are actually other hydrocarbons that need even lower pressure to keep them liquid. So you don't need, you don't need much of a crust to actually convert chemicals into liquids, you know, solids into liquids. 
uh, or, ga or make gases condense into a liquid. And, and, and astronomers don't, you know, they've not worked in chemical industry. They don't realize that, you know, out there, they don't know that comets contain all sorts of things inside. And even this meteorite that landed on the drive, you know, when they start to analyze that, they'll, they'll start to see the complexity. And all these things are, are you know, a lot more interesting than, than the simple models you might, might uh, imagine. Uh, they are so, yeah, um, yeah. I'll make sure you tell people there are cryovolcanoes on on comets on one comet anyway. <laughs> okay, well, I better go now. So, uh, and let right. you guys go. Right. So, thank you for your informative and very interesting presentation. The videos brought it to life. It was fascinating to watch, Jean. France, France, Francis, uh, Francois' um, video of 29P brightening up. Um, so let's thank Richard in the usual way. Okay. Well, if I, if I, when I give a talk again, I'll talk about something completely different and not mention any of this. <laughs> <laughs> okay.